Chapter 14 is the longest chapter in Mark's Gospel. It contains Jesus' betrayal, Peter's denial of Jesus and the Last Supper and his trial before the Sanhedrin. Throughout Mark, but particularly in chapter 14, there are a number of odd details. Details that it's difficult to see why Mark included unless he was using some other source that he didn't want to change. But all of these details appear to carry some deeper significance than simply the recounted specifics, suggesting that there may have been a deeper literary purpose to their inclusion that would have been understood by Mark's contemporaries. But unifying them now into a whole message is a matter of speculation. I'll point these out as we come to them. Two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the chief priests and the experts in the law were trying to find a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, so there won't be a riot among the people. Now, while Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of costly aromatic oil from pure nard. After breaking open the jar, she poured it on his head, but some who were present indignantly said to one another, Why this waste of expensive ointment? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor. So they spoke angrily to her, but Jesus said, Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a good service for me. For you will always have the poor with you, and you can do good for them whenever you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She anointed my body beforehand for burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. The mention of Simon the leper here is our first odd detail. It's the only mention of this character in Mark. The scene takes place in his house in Bethany. and None of the figures except for Jesus and Simon the leper are named in this account, but names are added in other gospels. The business with the woman and the alabaster bottle and the ointment made of pure nard is clearly symbolic, as probably also is the 300 silver coins. But why mention Simon the leper? Could it be because this was a historical event that took place in the house of Simon the leper? Or could it be that the intention of the author is to convey Jesus' willingness to associate with the socially outcast and contagious? Verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus into their hands. When they heard this, they were delighted and promised to give him money. So Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray him. So what actually did Judas betray? It wasn't Jesus' identity because he'd been teaching publicly. Doubt it was that he claimed to be the Son of God, the thing that he'd been trying to hush everybody up about. One theory among scholars is that what Judas told the priests was that Jesus was claiming to be an earthly messiah or military leader, which would have been highly relevant at the time when Mark was written, because such an activity would very likely have got you put to death by the Romans, according to Josephus in War of the Jews. Verse 12. Now, on the final day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and told them, Go into the city. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a large upstairs room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. The man carrying the water jar is our next odd detail. Why is this jar of water included? It clearly does have symbolic potential, but what Mark meant by it is not clear. Historicists suggest that a man carrying water was exceptional, as this was usually a task of women. But if that is true, then it's unlikely that it happened. And there has been much non-scholarly speculation as to whether this is a reference to Aquarius. Verse 17. Then when it was evening, he came to the house with the twelve. While they were at the table eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you eating with me will betray me. They were distressed, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who dips his hand with me into the bowl. For the Son of Man will go, as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for him if he had never been born. This happens when they're at the table eating, but before the events of the Lord's Supper. 
At least it comes in Mark before the events of the Lord's Supper. It doesn't explicitly state in the text that one came after the other. Verse 22. While they were eating, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. And after taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant that is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. In my video on the Lord's Supper, I discuss this in detail, but basically there are so many commonalities between this and Paul's version that this must be dependent on Paul or both must originate from a common source. Of course, Mark puts in a lot of historicising details that Paul doesn't have. Verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. The quote here is from Zechariah 13, verse 7, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that it's not a chapter about the Messiah. What Mark's doing here is trawling the scriptures for snippets that will support his idea. He hasn't got that idea from the text he's quoting. Then Jesus says, after I am raised, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Note that because there's a reference back to it in Mark 16 after the resurrection. Verse 29. Peter said to him, even if they all fall away, I will not. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth today, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I must die with you, I will never deny you. And all of them said the same thing. That's set up for Peter's denial, which of course Peter does eventually get round to, but it's a little bit too far on in the text to be regarded as another Markian sandwich. Another thing to note about these couple of verses is the time stamp it gives. Jesus says that during the night, before the rooster crows, which would be the dawn call of the rooster, he will deny him three times. Verse 32. Then they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John with him and became very troubled and distressed. He said to them, my soul is deeply grieved even to the point of death, remain here and stay alert. Going a little farther, he threw himself to the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour would pass from him. This scene is set up so that Mark can show the disciples faithlessness and to give Judas an opportunity to go and do his job of betraying. Verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Mark puts the word Abba here, which is father in Hebrew and Aramaic, and then translates it into Greek. The reason may be that the term Abba in Aramaic implied a much closer emotional bond than did father in Greek. Verse 37, Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Couldn't you stay awake for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again and prayed the same thing. When he came again, he found them sleeping. They could not keep their eyes open, and they didn't know what to tell him. He came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough of that. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us go. Look, my betrayer is approaching. Here the disciples fall asleep three times on account of the spirit being willing, but the flesh being weak. This passage is one of the best examples of the obviously fictional element in Mark because he recounts the actions and prayers of Jesus in a situation where there was nobody else present to observe and recount what happened later. He's using the fiction writer's viewpoint. Christians get around this by saying that God was the witness and he told Mark what to write. Realistically though, this is pretty hard evidence that at least some of Mark is fiction, if you need such. I'm sure you know the joke about the photographer who encountered a ghost and was convinced nobody would believe him. So he asked the ghost if he could take his photograph. The ghost agreed. It was night, so he used a flash, but unfortunately the photograph was underexposed. You see, the spirit was willing, but the flash was weak. 
It's not clear what Mark meant by the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. He may have had a dualistic idea of human nature with the disciples' spirits being willing but their flesh being weak. Or he may have been referring to the Holy Spirit as being willing to participate but the humans were too weak. In any event, there's a parallel of threes here. Peter falls asleep three times, then later denies Jesus three times. Verse 43. Right away, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him came a crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent by the chief priests and experts in the law and elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. When Judas arrived, he went up to Jesus immediately and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they took hold of him and arrested him. One of the bystanders drew his sword and struck the high priest's slave, cutting off his ear. Jesus said to them, Have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me like you would an outlaw? Day after day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, yet you did not arrest me. But this has happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. A young man was following him, wearing only a linen cloth. They tried to arrest him, but he ran off naked, leaving the linen cloth behind. What scripture is to be fulfilled by his arrest? None we know today, and Mark doesn't say. So he's betrayed by this notorious kiss. In this gospel, it's a bystander who drew his sword and struck the high priest's slave, and Jesus did not heal the slave in this gospel. There are two more odd details here. The bystander cutting off the high priest's slave's ear with a sword. It's a bit difficult to imagine this actually happening, but I suppose it's possible. On the other hand, cutting off an ear with a sword has potential symbolic meaning in taking away somebody's ability to hear. Then we have in verse 51 and 2 this young man who they seize, but he ran off naked, leaving his linen cloth behind. We'll see more about linen cloth later. Could this be a relic from a historical event, or does it have a symbolic meaning? Verse 53, Then they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and elders and experts in the law came together. And Peter had followed him from a distance up to the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the guards and warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they did not find anything. Many gave false testimony against him, but their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands and in three days build another one not made with hands. Yet even on this point their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is this that they are testifying against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again the high priest questioned him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your verdict? They all condemned him as deserving death. Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to strike him with their fists, saying, Prophesy! The guards also took him and beat him. Verse 62 refers to two Old Testament passages. The Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power is from verse 1 of Psalm 110, and coming with the clouds of heaven refers to Daniel 7 verse 13. That last reference at least is to a chapter about the Messiah, whereas Psalm 110 is not, it's about King David. Now while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the high priest's slave girls came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked directly at him and said, You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, but he denied it. I don't even understand what you're talking about. Then he went out to the gateway and a rooster crowed. When the slave girl saw him, she began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them, but he denied it again. A short time later, the bystanders again said to Peter, you must be one of them, because you are also a Galilean. Then he began to curse, and he swore with an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered what Jesus had said to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times and he broke down and wept. This gives that timestamp because Jesus previously said that Peter's denial would occur that night, so this must be the dawn call of the rooster. That means that the trial before the Sanhedrin occurred during the night. 
an assertion that seems a little far-fetched. And that ends chapter 14. Peter's denial is one of the most iconic pericopes of the New Testament, and it's been the inspiration behind a number of works of art. It's obviously contrived, though. A cock crows halfway through, and Peter still doesn't remember Jesus' prediction until it crows again. The historicity of this story is highly doubtful, but there's no doubting its importance as a literary theme. If Mark was writing his gospel to convert a previously mythicist church to historicism, then Peter's denial has a rather different significance. And there may be a further hint of this in chapter 16. 